please give a warm welcome to Brendan Gregg. G'day. I'm going to show you how to get started finding performance wins using the BPF technology. If you do a search for this topic, you'll find there's articles that are not really aimed at beginners and articles that were true but are now out of date. My goal is to help everyone get started quickly and easily finding performance wins. So what is BPF? BPF nowadays is a technology that is a bytecode and an execution environment. It is no longer an acronym. If you search for this, you'll find many articles that are confusing and need to be updated. BPF does many things, but what I'd like to talk about is performance wins using BPF. Now, the best way to get started is to think like a sysadmin and not like a programmer. When you think about BPF, and it's a bytecode and execution environment where you can write programs, it's intuitive to start thinking, maybe I should write Hello World, and then from Hello World, I'll write something more complicated. That's actually not the best way to get started with BPF for performance wins. The best way is to install the tools and run them and get some quick wins. I used to be a system administrator a long time ago, and part of my job was to make sure that the software my company needed was available on all the systems so people could use it. So thinking like a sysadmin, we want to get value out of BPF. What can we install and how can we use it? BCC Tools has many performance tools that you can run straight away. And so install that and you can use things like exec, snoop, open snoop, and so on. When you run exec snoop, that will help you identify problems of periodic running processes. You might be surprised at what you find. Things that you've forgotten about that are in cron tab that are perturbing the production performance of the system, increasing latency and increasing those tail latencies. Open snoop is another great tool to run to find misconfigurations. When the system is looking for files that don't exist, that maybe they used to exist, but they've since been lost in a system migration. TCP Life is another great tool for finding performance problems, and there you can look for unexpected TCP sessions. ext4 Slower characterizes storage system performance by showing you the latency at the file system level where it matters to the application. Biosnoop, you can use that to look for unusual disk latency patterns, and so on and so on. There are many tools. To give you an idea of how they get used together, last year we had a Cassandra database instance with poor performance. I began by using the IOSTAT tool, the standard system disk statistics, and could see that there was a read workload and a, some amount of disk utilization. This database service is very sensitive to IO latency. And so what I'd like to do is drill down into this workload and get more information about how it's performing. So from these high-level statistics, I then tried the BCC Biosnoop tool. And that gives me lots of columns I can study. I can look at the latency per event for disk I.O., the sectors, the disks accessed, and so on. But what caught my eye was Perl. I didn't know Cassandra was written in Perl. Cassandra is not written in Perl. Cassandra is a Java application. But here there was Perl doing a lot of disk reads. So having a look at what it was, I found it was Netflix EC2 rotate logs, a log rotation service that we have on all of our instances, but it had gone haywire on this particular instance, and it was causing a lot of disk reads. And that's it. The problem is solved. All I did was use a tool. It pointed me in the right direction and I was able to get that performance win. I didn't have to do any coding. And that's my main recommendation for you is look at those tools and I've picked five really good ones to start with and try running them on your systems and finding unusual activity. And you might find some quick wins as well. Apart from those five tools, there are many more to try. So this diagram I've drawn, this really captures what, why Observer, BPF observability is special. It's because it lets us see into all these areas that 
previously were difficult. In this particular diagram, in black are the tools that were already published. They're mostly BCC tools. And in red, I have BPF trace tools, another front end. These are ones I developed for a BPF book, but they're also open source. So I've developed many of these tools, and my goal is to arm you to solve more than 90% of performance issues using canned observability tools alone. And these tools are very quick to run, and there's documentation with them so that you can get started in a hurry, much more quickly than firing up a source code editor and trying to write BPF performance tools from scratch. Now, while the tools are great, the future of BPF performance observability for most people is going to be GUIs. I have an example screenshot here. This is developed by my colleague Susie at Netflix. And she has it so you can click on investigation reports, pick CPUs, file systems, networking, and then it gives you a canned report or, or wizard showing different tool outputs. And so if you think you've got a disk issue, you look at the disk report, and hopefully 90% of those disk issues are solved from that one report just by clicking a button. I think it's worthwhile to learn the tools, and my previous book covered the tools, because these GUIs are built upon either the same observability metrics or actually the same tool. So once you learn how to use ExecSnoop and BioLatency and BioSnoop, you see the same things in the future GUIs or the GUIs we're building now. One of the hardest things about actually getting good at BPF performance analysis is knowing how to interpret these. It seemed really easy in my case study where I went from IOSTAT to BioSnoop to PS. But when you're faced with an unusual performance issue, this sequence may not be readily apparent. So you can use the tools right now. You can use the BCC tools right now. And then in the future, if this becomes a GUI, where you can click a button and get the same output, you have solid experience in how to solve performance issues and what the output of these tools mean. Now, I said think like a sysadmin, where sysadmins will install something and use it and not necessarily program. But sometimes sysadmins do program. Sometimes you need to do something that's a little bit extra than what the CAN software provides. And so sysadmins will do some shell scripting and some awk or sed. The equivalent for performance observability is BPF trace. BPF trace, which is very much like awk, allows you to write simple tools and one liners that go beyond the CAN tools. Now, there are times when you should think like a programmer and not like a sysadmin. That might be for the less than 10% of performance issues where the CAN tools don't solve and you need to write something custom. Maybe you're doing a BPF-based startup. You're debugging your own code. You're doing something that's not performance observability. BPF is a really big topic. You're doing networking, security. Then you will need to do a lot of BPF coding. And there's another reason. Learning BPF internals can help you use BPF tools even if you never write the code. And so that might be another reason to explore programming in more detail. Now, for coding BPF performance tools, the language you should start with is BPF trace. It's the newest language that we've developed. It's concise, it's like pseudocode, and that makes it easy to develop and maintain. BCC is an older front end, but it's still in heavy use. And BCC has different languages that it provides. One of the earliest ones, or the earliest one, was the Python C interface. And a newer one is libbpf C interface. If you search on how to get started in BPF, you'll see much, many documents on the Python C interface, and I wrote some of them. But now we're actually, for the performance tools, we're moving into the, onto the libbpf interface because it doesn't require LLVM and it allows new lightweight tools to be developed. And so that's going to be the the interface for the future of performance tools. The Python C interface is from BCC will still see use for other uses. So you might be a BPF startup and you've built something upon the Python interface, you'll keep using that. 
Now, I said you should start with BPF Trace, and so here's an example so you can see what that looks like. For many years, I've been wanting to write a program or a tool to show me the effectiveness of the file system read ahead or prefetch algorithm to see if it's polluting caches because it's reading too much or if it's reading too little. And so I finally did it with BPF Trace where I wrote the tool. It shows me what I decided to do was the age of pages that were read when they were actually referenced. And so if Read Ahead is reading lots of pages from disk that aren't referenced for many, many minutes, you know it's too aggressive. And so this gives a histogram. It's great. But what's really great is the source code for this fits on one slide. So I'm not going to go through the source code now, but this really shows the power of BPF trace. It's basically boiled down the problem into the pseudocode. There's no boilerplate here. It's just the tool itself. Now I mentioned in BCC, the new interface is libbpf, and many of you may not have looked at it yet. LibBPF, what it allows us to do is create these standalone binaries that have BPF bytecode embedded. And so earlier this year, I coded OpenSnoop, and you can see there's it doesn't use libLLVM, and stripped, it's 151 kilobytes. So think about that, 151 kilobytes for a standalone binary, a BPF performance tool that just runs. And you can run this on embedded systems that have storage constraints. So that's really exciting. For BPF trace, that's quite different. BPF trace runs those scripts or text programs. We're hoping to come up with a static BPF trace that's similar, that uses BTF, the BPF type format, so that it doesn't need all of this LLVM compilation. And so we can have a static BPF trace plus many scripts, also taking a small average tool size and making it suitable for embedded environments. To make the future work, we do need this config option set. So as a public service announcement, please make sure config debug info BTF is set to yes. And Ubuntu 2010 does have it. Now about the future of BPF. So I've done a lot with performance tools, but BPF is more than just performance and observability. So we'll be able to write kernel mode applications in BPF. And there are many advantages of those. And it's, it's different. In a way, we need to redraw the system diagram. So there's user mode, kernel mode, and now this special BPF kernel mode. This isn't the first time that an op the operating system model has been changed. There have been many research projects about different OS models, but they have not seen widespread use. BPF is seeing widespread use, a new type of software. So that's really exciting. I've drawn this diagram to explain why BPF is different to user mode and kernel mode. And so it is user defined and it is secure. It's failure mode is error messages, and it has better access to resources than writing user level applications. Although I need to add IOU ring is another new technology that helps with user mode applications there. So the takeaway is if you're new to BPF or if you're not new to BPF, please find some BPF performance wins. Think like a sysadmin, install BCC and BPF trace. Get the performance tools available, run them, find some wins. This is really important. And what motivated me to create this talk is some of my coworkers are getting into BPF and they're beginning with these hollow world complex programs. And after a few days of compiler errors, they haven't gotten anywhere. And so they're starting to get a bad taste about BPF. So I think it'd be great if you all use BPF, use the CAN tools, which try to solve 90% of performance issues find some wins to start with, tell your management, your company, BPF is great, we should continue investing in it, and here's concrete proof about things that's solved for us. And once you've found some performance wins, then by all means, do programming, write your own tools, write your own things. But start with the tools, find some quick wins, so you're starting in a great place. From re for references, 
I do want to mention, I did do a blog post about this at the start of 2019. That's still generally true, where I say try BCC tools first, then BPF trace, and then you can get into more advanced development. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brendan. Fantastic presentation. Really exciting introduction to eBPF. Quickly checking, Brendan, can you hear me for the Q&A? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Welcome. So we have a first question. We'll dive right in. Um, and in the meantime, everybody can give a warm applause in the Slack channel. Uh, first question, BCC tools, BPF trays are cool. Do you, re do you recommend any tools to create some scenarios, simulated environment on my machine so that I can use these tools to debug? Just playing with these tools on a normal desktop machine is kind of boring. I'm aware of some tools like TaskSet. Do you, do you recommend anything else? So if you start running these tools on production workloads and you don't have any familiarity, it can be confusing because you're seeing things for the first time. So it's a good question. And what I recommend you do is to start with micro benchmarks and you can also write your own micro benchmark. Imagine you write a 20 line C program that does this type of file system IO or this type of network IO. You understand at a very low level, the workload that's applied. Now you run the BCC or BPF trace tools on your own workload and see how that matches. You can also use off-the-shelf microbenchmark tools like Jens's FIO for file system tests or NetPerf for networking tests. That's a great way to get experience and get the hang of the tool output. I also, I mean, I, I run Linux on my laptop and so I'll run the tools on Chrome and Firefox and like everything. And so I'm always getting familiarity with what's going on and discovering things. It's definitely a great way to explore the system just by running these tools. Uh, Tristan is asking, with BPF trace and libbpf being so good, is there, is there still room for BCC? So with BPF trace, if I'm writing new tools, BPF trace, like a sysadmin, is, is what I use to hack something together. It's just so quick. It's like putting something together in org. And most tools I create are going to stay as B, BPF trace. Now, there are some tools where this is so, this is going to be so commonly used. I, I want to keep developing it and I want it to have all these command line options and custom arguments. And at that point, I'll look to moving it to, to porting it to BCC, have a libbpf version. So you can run minus H and it has all these complicated things that you can use. So I think probably one in 10 tools that I create going forward are going to be such a common use case that I'll put them in BCC as well so that we can develop them further and add all those arguments. But a lot of the more niche ones I'll leave as a BP, BPF trace tool because it's easier to maintain that way. Ah, and so uh, at the moment, like, I mean, Dtrace, I, I will, I'll take Dtrace over nothing. So if I log into a system and Dtrace is there, at least I can do low level debugging, but eBPF has gone further, not just in observability tools, but also these other applications. Excellent. I think we could keep talking for a, for, for a long while, but unfortunately we have to uh, move on to the next keynote. I hope you can stay on the Slack channel a bit longer and answer some of the additional questions. Before we go to the next keynote, please give Brendan another round of applause. Fantastic talk. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Thank you. And I'll be on Slack. Excellent.